amazingly how we are reading writings from over 2,000, 2,600 years ago, God. We live in an age where we're going to see portions of this book, Lord, are, are transpiring right before our eyes and the things that are going on. God, I pray we don't make it to the end of the book. I pray that or you take us soon. But if you don't, Lord, we just want to be always watching, God. We want to be aware. We want to grow, Lord. We want your Holy Spirit, who you sent, to teach us your word that we can be, Lord, ready in season and out of season in the days we're living in. So desperate, Lord, it's such a, a need like never before, Lord. There always is, but God help us to just be, Lord, shining brighter than ever, God, we ask. Feed us from your word, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, there are certain books here in the Bible that are kind of like a spiritual glue in that they help bind together all the books of the Bible as a whole, as one unit. Daniel is one of those, especially as it pertains to biblical prophecy. Understanding this book gives great insight. You can't understand the book of Revelation without understanding Daniel or the Lord's Olivet Discourse or certain writings of the apostles without a working knowledge of the book of Daniel. And there's multiple cross-references here in the Old Testament. So it's no surprise that the book of Daniel has come under some of the severest attacks with regards to its integrity and its validity. Throughout history, people have sought to undermine this book because that would cause other parts of the Bible to be suspect. Because other parts of the Bible, including Jesus, quoted from this book. And so the critics, as always, you know, unfortunately, they're long, well, for them, they're long gone, good riddance, you know. <laughs> But the book remains throughout, you know, all empires, all history, all criticism, as always, you know, the book of Daniel remains. And for anyone willing to do your homework, there's no reason to doubt the validity of this book of Daniel anyway. But suffice it to say, like I said, the Lord Jesus, he had no problem with its integrity. He quoted it several times, which is good enough for me. The ironic thing is that even though the book of Daniel is essential for binding together biblical prophecy, Daniel himself is never referred to as a prophet in the traditional sense here in the New Testament. In the Hebrew Bible, the book of Daniel is not included among the other prophets, but it is placed in the portion of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible known as the writings. It's amongst the poetry and history books. That's because unlike... The other Hebrew prophets here in the Old Testament, God never delivered a message to the nation of Israel directly through Daniel. At least that we know of. There's no recording of it in the Bible, but he is definitely a messenger of Jehovah and very important one. Very significant revelations were given either to him or through him, and that's the main way that this book can be broken down. In the first part, chapters 1 through 6, really 2 through 6, Daniel is used to interpret other people's visions and dreams. In the second part, 7 through 12, Daniel is given his own visions, a very rough outline. Chapter 1 here is introductory. It's not prophetic at all, but it lays out the historical and biographical framework upon which this book is built. Now, interestingly as well, the book of Daniel was written originally in two different languages. Chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 4 is written in Hebrew. And then when the content of the book switches to world affairs that relate to the Gentile nations of the earth, chapters 2, verse 5 through chapter 7, the language also switches to Aramaic, their language. And then when the context of the book switches back to dealing with Israel 
and their future, the language also switches back to Hebrew, chapters 8 through 12. So there's a lot of interesting idiosyncrasies to this book, and I'll point those out as we go along. Beyond just, its prof beyond just its prophetic content. And that's why, because of these idiosyncrasies, that's why it's grouped in the Tanakh with the Psalms and the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Ruth, and others. It's a very unique book. It stands apart from the prophetic books, but it is prophetic. It begins with the date in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. According to 2 Kings chapter 23, Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, the king of Judah, <clears throat> he was raised to the throne by Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. So a foreign king placed him on the throne, and he remained a tributary for three years to Egypt. In his fourth year, a major battle was fought between Egypt and Babylon, according to history, and the Egyptian army was defeated. That victory placed all the Middle East under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and so Jehoiakim here became a tributary to Nebuchadnezzar. After three years, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Not a wise move, but he, he came, Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem, besieged it, and as it says in verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, one of the first things Bible critics contested for years was the discrepancy in the dating between Jeremiah and Daniel. They both wrote about the same events and both had the audacity to give a date of when they included, only the dates are different. Jeremiah says this happened in his fourth year. Daniel says in his third. And the critics, aha, you know, you can't trust the Bible. It's full of contradictions. If you can't trust this, how can you trust the words of Jesus? That's what they would say. Until later discoveries came to light that showed how the Chaldean and Hebrew systems of dating their rulers' reigns were based upon different calendars that began at different times of the year. And Daniel, writing from his location in Babylon, was using their dating system, while Jeremiah, living 500 miles away in Judea, used the Hebrew method of dating, and it reconciled the two accounts perfectly. Of course it did. Oh, gee, never mind, said the critics. Sorry for stumbling centuries of people who had bought into their higher criticism, as it's called. Just read the Bible and trust it. You know? It's very trustworthy. Not only has it been shown that there is not any discrepancy in the biblical account, but once again, the Bible is shown to be so miraculously accurate. It's like God places these things in there. Just go, go for it, man. Instead, you, you just, you know, discredit my word, and then he just brings a checkmate and says, you know, sorry. He makes it just so incredibly detailed for a book documenting events 2,600 years ago. So the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, these are the articles we saw in Ezra chapter 1 on Wednesday that were being carefully counted and returned by King Cyrus of Persia after the Jews' 70 years in Babylonian captivity. This is thought to be most likely where Ezra learned that Nebuchadnezzar had put the articles of the house of God into the house of his God, as it says in Ezra 1 which was a purposeful insult to God's honor. As Cyrus made right, if you were here Wednesday, we saw, you know, he made sure that their God was shown to be nothing. And Cyrus came into power and made everything right. So you can see cross-references from Daniel in many books of the Bible. It ties a lot together. It was in this first conquest by Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel had been taken to Babylon. 
and the specifics of that are given in verses 3 and 4. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Now, as you pull together Bible dates here, you see that Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, as well as Zephaniah and Habakkuk all lived at the same time. Daniel and Ezekiel were very young, Jeremiah being much older, who along with Zephaniah and Habakkuk are thought to have influenced the lives of Daniel and Ezekiel. Most likely did, but it doesn't say exactly. How much they interacted, it's hard to know exactly. It doesn't say that. But you see Daniel reading Jeremiah's prophecies in Daniel 7. You see Ezekiel prophesying of Daniel's righteousness in Ezekiel 14. So there are hints throughout of their having contact with one another. Daniel is seen being taken into captivity a very young age, probably around 13, maybe all the way to 19, but a very young, he was taken, as it says here, into the royal palace, where he is trained and he is schooled in the ways of the Chaldeans. So as to oversee, when you, when you look at this from a broad perspective, he's put there to oversee the preservation of God's people Israel and their future remnant, similar to how Joseph in Genesis played a prominent role in the affairs of the Gentile world power that Israel was subject to at that time. They're very similar. While that was going on with Daniel, Jeremiah was back in Judea overseeing the destruction of the nation, of the capital city of Jerusalem, and of the temple, and writing lamentations and crying. While that was going on, Ezekiel was taken to Babylon during a later siege, and instead of being taken to the palace, like Daniel, Ezekiel remained with Israel's remnant. He remained with the people in a POW camp far away from the palace. He ministered directly to them as the Hebrew prophets did. He spoke directly to them while they were in captivity. So when you piece it all together, you get this wider picture of what was going on during the Babylonian captivity all over. As for Daniel, it says the king instructed Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs, the eunuchs were an administrative class in the governments of ancient kings due to their unique imposed physical condition as castrated males they held positions of great power in ancient kingdoms just because they posed no threat to the king and so their loyalty was of great value Ashpenaz, it says, was the master of the eunuchs, verse 3. So he's the top guy, and he's put in charge of this job here. Some of these young Jewish prisoners, among whom was Daniel, whose pedigree is described in verse 3. He was uh, the king of the king's descendants. He was uh, one of the king's nobles of the children of Israel. And so uh, the descendants here of the king, as well as being nobles, those would be those amongst the king's descendants who were actually in line for the throne. The king had a lot of offspring. But these were the princes out of his offspring who any one of them could have been a future king to the nation of Israel. And so... You know, that's where Daniel's pedigree comes from. He could have, had Israel existed, been, you know, put on the throne at some time. And so it says there, as far as his physical appearance, they were young men in whom there was no blemish, good looking. And so physically attractive, no defects, but also gifted, verse 4 says, in all wisdom and possessing knowledge, quick to understand. So good-looking and intelligent, wisdom being a gift 
of using the intellect properly. Knowledge is just, uh, you know, trained or gaining lots of information on various subjects, but they were also able, it says, to learn more very easily. So pretty high standards were required. They got to be good looking, they got to be smart, and they would have to have the ability after their training to serve in the king's palace, who he might teach the language, it says at the end of verse 4, and literature, the Chaldeans. So they were being trained to serve in the king's palace, and due to that, they were going to be trained language and the culture. Through this, you know, just these two verses, we actually know more about Daniel personally than any of the other Old Testament prophets. He stood out physically. He had this incredible pedigree. Intellectually, heritage-wise, he stood out from all his peers that had been taken into captivity. He and others like him were to be immersed in Babylonian culture, in their language, literature, so as to train them for future service in the king's court. And the king, verse 5 says, appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacy. So this is directly, you know, being orchestrated by the king through his top official. He, the king appointed daily provision of his delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them with this so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, on top of all their spiritual or their special education in language and knowledge, they were being wined and dined is the idea. They were being courted by the king personally so as to bring them into favor with him so that they would eventually become willing servants. They wouldn't want to leave. Who would want to? You know, you got, you're just brought right into luxury after, you know, being a prisoner of war. The treatment here would have actually been far above what they received in Jerusalem as nobles in the days leading up to their captivity. They came from being oppressed to elevated to this position. Now from among those, so out of them, the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Now the name Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge. He's given the name Belteshazzar, which, mean, which means Bel's prince. Bel was a Babylonian idol. Hananiah in Hebrew means Jehovah has been gracious. His name is changed to Shadrach, which means royal. Mishael in Hebrew means who is like God. His name is changed to Meshach, which means guest of the king. Azariah in Hebrew means Jehovah has helped. His name is changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nego. So again, it's a reverence, reference to a pagan king or a pagan god. So all the references to Jehovah, God, every, all of their heritage, their spiritual heritage is removed. And all of this is being imposed upon them in order to swerve them away from their Jewish beliefs and traditions. They're given a whole, you know, identity change. Not for the worse, but for the better, at least as it would be seen by the world. You know, they're being given an upgrade from what the world, and obviously all but four of them, you know, saw it as. They're being provided special treatment that would gain them advancement and advantages, even above Babylonian youth. All these carnal pleasures were provided right from the king's own table, the king's making friends with them, all of which was being used to alienate them from their Jewish roots by causing them to abandon the God of their fathers and to forsake their homeland by giving up their national language, their national history, national identity, and align themselves with the oppressors of their people. And worst of all, they are being seduced into worshiping and serving idols, 
false gods of Babylonians, which would be fatal for their spiritual identities. But, it says in verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you see fit so deal with your servants now there were four people named everybody somebody anybody and nobody and there was an important job to do and everybody was asked to do it but everybody was sure that somebody would do it anybody could have done it but nobody did it Somebody got angry because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody would do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it, and it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. <laughs> That's just how it always is. <laughs> anybody could do what Daniel does here, but not everybody's willing. Your faith is going to be put to the test. Daniel made a conscious effort to not compromise his relationship with God. To say that he did not defile himself, that means he sought exemption for spiritual purposes. So he didn't try to weasel out of it, some other reason, oh, dude, I got a stomach ache. <laughs> he purposed in his heart to stand upon his principles. By the standards of that day, to share a meal with someone was to commit yourself to an intimate relationship with them. Daniel's like, I can't do that. That was a line that he determined he couldn't cross. It says in verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. The wording here makes it apparent that God had gone before Daniel in preparing the way for his bold stand. It doesn't say that Daniel knew of this favor prior to his decision to stand upon his principles. See, many times it's not until after I take that step of faith that I realize God has provided for the success of my step of faith before I even took it. That makes me wonder how many advantages have I failed to receive from the Lord just due to unbelief. So if you would have taken had everything in place, this is mentioned after the fact. Daniel steps out in faith requesting this exemption only to find that God had brought him into the favor and goodwill of Ashpenaz, who tells Daniel of his fear of being not just reprimanded but executed if he doesn't carry out his orders properly. The king himself had commanded this menu. The king was orchestrating this. Refusing to go along with it would have caused Daniel and his three friends to be viewed as uncooperative, as, you know, rebellious. They would have lost their opportunity to be advanced at least, if not worse. They probably would have been killed. In proposing this alternative, Daniel's seen as exercising divine wisdom. James 3.17 says, The wisdom that is from above is pure, it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, but without partiality, without hypocrisy. Daniel doesn't say, I'm not doing it. You know, he doesn't get defensive. He doesn't get argumentative. He operates with divine wisdom. And that's a, that is what you see in Daniel's response here, the definition given in James 3. 
And so upon purposing in his heart, you know, come what may, dude, I am not going to defile my relationship with God. And steps out in faith, Daniel finds God's favor had already gone before him. He finds himself being filled with divine wisdom to accomplish the job. He realizes Ashpenaz, he, he realizes that, you know, he, he has favor towards him. But, you know, he has a responsibility. Daniel relieves him of the responsibility by making his appeal to the steward, verse 11 says. So Daniel said to the steward, so the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, was not opposed to Daniel not eating from the king's table. He was opposed to having his head cut off. You know, that's what he, he was, I'm not opposed to you doing it. I just throw my head cut off. And so the idea here is just do it in a way that I don't have to know about it. And so Daniel makes his proposition to the chief of the eunuchs subordinate. And it doesn't say whether they were coordinated. Probably didn't. Daniel just went to him without, you know, and, and, and having this Ashpenaz guy even aware of it, even though he was good with it. And that would relieve him Ashpenaz of his culpability if the plan didn't work. And I didn't know what these guys were doing. So he says to him, you know, test us for 10 days with vegetables. Vegetables would include any kind of grain or any other plant, just not meat. Meat from the king's table, that would have been unkosher. It would be specifically identified as belonging to the king's false god. That's how it worked. It would be a form of pagan worship to partake of that. And Daniel says, I can't do that. So it's like, you can call me whatever name you want to call me. You call me Belteshazzar, that's fine. You can, you can give me a, a earthly advantages, praise the Lord. I'll take them. Free education, special favor, I'm not going to complain. But when it comes to compromising my faith, my relationship with God, I won't do that. Anybody can stand upon such spiritual principles, but not everybody does. But when somebody does, it's only then that they experience what nobody else will. He consented with them, it says in verse 14, in this matter, and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So not only does Daniel discover what's called God's prevenient grace. That is a theological term that speaks of divine grace awaiting those who step out in faith. Not only does he experience that, that God had gone before him, provided things for him, but he's also filled with divine wisdom as he proceeds. And now he sees supernatural, mir miraculous hand of God upon their physical appearance. There'd be no biological reason for a vegetarian diet, making them better and fatter in the flesh, as it says in verse 15, than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. See, it wasn't that they just looked the same, even, that they just blended in. They appeared more beautiful, healthier. They stood out even more than everybody else. So that for three years, while their preparation for service in the king's court was taking place, they were exempt from what was in the world's eyes, not, you know, just some food, man. <laughs> just food, what's the problem? But for them, it meant serving and honoring God first, not your God. I'm not going to, you know, honor your God. God is put first before anything or anyone else, to which it says in verse 17, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, anybody could have received God's blessings in this way. 
but nobody did except these four young men who everybody knows about because somebody named Daniel purposed in his heart and his friends ended up getting blessed with him. He took a stand and he, and he saw God's blessings flow. God is not going to leave me hanging when I step out upon you know, the principles that are in his word. When I don't deny him in the face of a world that's saying, just, you know, just compromise. It'll be so much easier. Everything will go easy. Then you can take it, you know. I can't do that. I can't compromise with the world and serve God at the same time. That was, that's what Daniel in spite of their diminished provisions in comparison to all the other young men, God blessed them above the rest, giving them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom so they were given superior understanding of Babylonian culture and Babylonian knowledge, what would be called science today, which the Babylonians were noted historically as having been advanced in, these four young men were superior to the rest, even the Babylonians in all of that, without defiling themselves with the carnal aspects that higher education comes with. They were in Babylon, but they were not of Babylon. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, verse 17 says. That is an attribute of his that would be revealed later on, but it is acknowledged at this point as being something God had already uh, uh, granted him, again, due to what's called provenient grace. God just, he's got grace upon grace upon grace for the rest of Daniel's life. Grace having been provided in advance that can only be recognized in hindsight. God's hand was totally in this. But it wasn't until I stepped out that I saw his grace was there waiting for me. And as we all know, it's a, God's mercies, his grace literally is, is new every morning. The word is plural. It means there's multiple opportunities to experience God's grace every day. And they're brand new every morning. If I will walk in them and step in, in faith according to what his word tells me and how I'm to be directed. And so it ends here, it says, now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all manners of wisdom, understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, astrologers who were in, the, in his realm. Thus Daniel continued, until, or this is how Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. So among them all, verse 19, and so the king interviewed among them all, that means among all the youths that have been brought from Judah, all the children of Israel, the youths from that country. So evidently these four were the only ones who remained faithful to the Lord. When the king interviewed them, verse 19, in all matters of Babylonian wisdom, understanding, verse 20, of which the magi or the magicians and the astrologers of Babylon prided themselves, these Jewish young men were ten times better, literally ten hands above. It's an Eastern idiom, hand over hand, they were ten times better. And again, anybody could have been ten times better, but nobody except these four were. Thankfully, somebody was, or nobody would have been left. Daniel continued in this superior position amongst the Babylonians, verse 21 says, until the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, who we read about in Ezra chapter 1. And as I said, it's believed by historians and rabbinic scholars, Daniel was the one who presented Cyrus with the scroll of Isaiah. He said, dude, our God named you 200 years ago. And the king of Persia, Cyrus, changed into the Jews' deliverer. 
And as is going to be seen in Daniel 6, Daniel was immediately set in one of the top governing positions in the Medo-Persian Empire, for which, out of jealousy, he gets thrown in the lion's den. So he definitely didn't live a life of quiet desperation. Anybody can, but not everybody does. But when somebody does, nobody has an excuse. So, <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this, this example, Lord, of Daniel. And there's others, but he stands out, God, because he was 13. He was a teenager. And he purposed in his heart, all the other teenagers, who knows who they are, nobody knows. But we all know who Daniel is. And he stands out, and we're thankful for the, for the example. And it's a pretty high bar, but God, by your Holy Spirit, we can walk according to your ways, by your power and your strength, and experience your provenient grace as well. What a blessing that is, God. You're not going to force us. You're not just going to pour it out, God. You, we have to come and see. I just see, and then I'll come. You, know, you say, come and see, and when I come, I see, Lord, that your grace is infinite, Lord, and your mercies new every day, Lord, your blessings are beyond what I can even ask or think. And so, Lord, please, by your strength and your ability, Lord, cause your word to wash over us, grow us, mature us, and make us, Lord, more like someone like Daniel, one of the examples here, and even more so conform us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.